thank you all for, for joining us today for a presentation uh, on detection and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders in pregnancy and postpartum. My name is Tim Hudson. I'm a behavioral health consultant with the Michigan Opioid Collaborative uh, with University of Michigan's anesthesiology department. Uh, we are offering CMEs and CEUs for attending this. I will post that information in the chat box. Uh, if you have questions, please don't be afraid to ask. Uh, post those in the chat box and I'll make sure they get addressed. I will now turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Maria Muzik. Uh, she is an associate professor in psychiatry and OBGYN at the University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine in Ann Arbor. She's a perinatal psychiatrist by training and serves as medical director of the U of M Perinatal and Women Reproductive Psychiatry Clinic and leads the integration of perinatal mental health services, family medicine and pediatrics, pediatrics across Michigan medicine and other health systems. She also leads as medical director in the, peri, the perinatal psychiatry access program across the state of Michigan called MC3 Perinatal that supports frontline providers and safe and effective treatments of their pregnant and postpartum patients. More recently, she has been working on integration of technology-based screening and remote access to mental health therapy for perinatal patients with prenatal care. She has also published extensively with 140 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters. She edited a book on motherhood in the face of trauma by Springer, and her research is funded by federal, state, and foundational grants. Dr. Music is also an educator and teaches both in medical, clinical, and community settings on perinatal mental health. I will now turn it over to you. Thanks a lot for having me today, uh, everyone. Uh, I hope, can you hear me well? Can you see my slides well? Give me a high five. Okay, good, excellent. So I will talk about the theme dear to my heart and my clinical work as well as my research work. And you, you, you heard about uh, that I'm also an educator and I love to teach. So with that, I want to talk about this theme. Why? Because this is an important one. Um, the facts speak for themselves. Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are the number one complication in pregnancy and childbirth, uh, much more common than preeclampsia and uh, diabetes or any of that. Um, uh, you will see the rates of illness uh, occurrence. And suicide is unfortunately also the number one cause of mom's mortality in the United States. Um, uh, that might not be true across the world because people die of, uh, women die of infections, but not in the United States. Here, women die because they have mental health consequences, suicide or, um, um, you know, accidental or, or, or intentional overdoses. Um, and the problem is that 50% or more of these perinatal mood disorders don't get detected and that, uh, less than 15% of women get adequate treatment and that actually it's costly for the mother, maybe with her life, to the unborn and born child, as well as for the family at large, as well as for society. There are good studies now by a colleague of mine, Kara Zivin, showing that untreated illness across the state, like for instance, for perinatal mood disorders in 2014, is estimated 14 billion uh, loss um, and or cost. So with that said, we should attend to it. And so from my perspective, what's this challenge? Why, why are we challenged by this? And what could be so solutions? And um, I definitely think something that we can tackle um, is, to, is to say, okay, we need to increase awareness. We need to um, uh, work on detection and we need to create access. Um, so let me walk you through this, um, these three points kind of quickly. So speaking of awareness, this is to kind of to review with you um, uh, the, um, you know, what are the rates, what are the illnesses that we're talking about? Um, so we have depression, we have the blues, which I don't call an illness, but I will highlight it here because it's so common that it's actually normative. We have psychosis, we have anxiety, generalized anxiety, but then we have also specific anxieties like panic attacks, OCD, which is not technically an anxiety disorder anymore, but we still kind of use it there in the anxiety spectrum. And we have post-traumatic stress disorder as a trauma-related anxiety. But you can see that the rates are pretty stunning. And 
depression, either in pregnancy, antenatal, or postpartum, is baseline is around five, 15%, and that's worldwide. I come originally from Austria, and we have great psychosocial services. We have three years of paid maternity leave. We have high, almost no poverty, socialized medicine. Guess what? There's still 15% baseline rate because it's a biological illness as well. There's hormonal changes, that are different contributions. But then you come here to the States and other places, Cape Town and you know uh, places where I do research, the rates go up to 40, 50, 60 percent. And so because that's the psychosocial contribution to uh, postpartum or perinatal depression with with, uh, you know, homelessness and racism and and access issues, detection issues and such. So what's the I will talk about the blues in a second, but just kind of briefly to review, and I hope that you all are aware of what what are the symptoms of depression? When do we speak of of clinical depression? Well, we have the DSM five. I'm sure you all know that that's basically the classification system. You have to have at least a two week period of depressed mood or loss of interest, which we call anhedonia, one of the other. And then you have several of those symptoms. We have a great mnemonic called city caps might be aware of that and that's basically it's around sleep loss of interest excessive guilt low energy poor concentration appetite reduced or elevated psychomotor retardation or agitation so it could be either way and then suicidality so that's the these are the symptoms please look out for those it's common it's important so is depression, postpartum depression, particularly the same as baby blues? Because often that gets mixed up and people say, oh, it's just the blues, get over it, right? Well, what's the blues? The blues is, as I said, almost normative. Symptoms are labile mood, some tearfulness, some disturbed sleep. Um, and it's not a major change in functionality. And it lasts Usually it starts on day two, three, four postpartum. So women are already home from the hospital. That's the problem. In Austria, we have we admit women up to 14 days paid by insurance in the hospital. They can get comfortable, they can start breastfeeding, they can get, but here we have 24 to 72 hours. So mostly women are already at home and then they have these mood symptoms. So it, but it resolves around week one two max and why do we have that well the the reason for the blues is the major reason is these hormonal changes if you look at progesterone and estradiol at birth maximum levels and then within hours it it goes down so this relative withdrawal of gonadal hormonal levels in the blood and in the stream is responsible for this mood kind of switch and kind of this uh, roller coaster and it resolves and the important piece is no treatment from a psychiatric perspective necessary just tender loving care and it's common as opposed to the psychosis and now you can see well psychosis can look a little bit similar again labile mood tearfulness agitation but this time severely disturbed sleep so some overlapping symptoms but just the volume is hyped up plus again it starts in the first week two after the birth so that's also similar in the peak onset but we have additional symptoms delusions hallucinations suicidality and that's infanticide risk and again why is this happening yes yeah, sure the hormonal shift is also triggering it but usually there is a baseline illness that was maybe not recognized yet bipolarity or psychosis that was either it's a family history or there was a pre-existing illness and nobody asked and it wasn't disclosed or it's the first onset of a psychotic episode in young women because as you know bipolarity in women the first onset could be between ages 20 and 30 and that's the problem that this could be the first time and so this is uh, basically in the general population rare but in women with pre-existing condition it is not that rare. And one 
particular risk is women who have been stable, who know they have a bipolar illness, they were stable on medicines, did well, then they get pregnant and somebody says, oh, these medicines are not safe for you. You have to stop them. And they discontinue. And then three, four months later, and definitely postpartum in the first week, they relapse. And then it's a major psychiatric emergency with um, need for more aggressive medication treatment. Sometimes we need we use ECT um, and definitely an inpatient admission. Okay, so that's the psychosis. So then we have anxiety. I'm sure you all are familiar with GAD. GAD is like the illness uh, that you know, many of us have, and in, in, it's a vexing and waning illness. So you might have been a, a warrior, you know, very warm when you were a kid, and then it kind of, you know, was in high school, and then you go to college, it gets worse, and then, you know, it gets better. But anxiety is very prone to reactivate in pregnancy or postpartum. And what we call it then postpartum anxiety or peripartum anxiety, it's actually really very, pretty common, up to 30% of women have clinical levels of anxiety, particularly now in the COVID era, when everything was very unsure for women, you know, what kind of treatment they get, whether they can have partners involved in the in birthing, the, we went, we saw rates 40, 50%. And the anxiety is that you're basically excessively worrying about things that are real, that could happen, that you're just kind of spending a lot of time about it. And then you have all these symptoms, these body symptoms that go along with it. I, in my clinical experience, there's a fine line going from kind of that GAD anxiety where you excessively worry about things that are unlikely but possible to more OCD type of worrying, where you have like these sticky thoughts, these sticky fixations of more unlikely events, things that are, yeah, still possible, but even more unlikely than to really psychosis where you have pre intense preoccupation with anxiety to actually more bizarre uh, delusional thoughts. And this is really important because I want to highlight one uh, phenomenon. It's called the scary thoughts of harming the baby in peripartum, particularly postpartum. So if you ask any postpartum woman, if she ever had suddenly an intrusive thought that something bad is going to happen to her baby, you will hear that actually almost every woman has that. Uh, women don't talk about it because they feel embarrassed. They feel like, what is this? Um, and they might feel like if I disclose my thoughts, people are going to think I'm crazy and they're going to call CPS on me. So many women have this intrusive thought coming on and off. Something bad is going to happen to my baby. A fraction of those, 50% of those have the thoughts that they themselves might be harming the baby. So these thoughts could be, I walk down the flight of stairs and suddenly I have that thought, I dropped the baby. Um, you know, and, and then not just accidentally, but I kind of let the baby go. Or I'm standing at a balcony um, and suddenly I have that thought, what if I throw the baby out of the way, kind of off the balcony? I come to the kitchen, see a knife and suddenly I have that thought, what if I stab my baby? Um, or I, I see a pillow and suddenly I have that thought of smothering my baby. It, these are thoughts that come and go and they are intrusive, cause distress. We call this ego dystonic. This, this makes no sense to the mom. It's an anxiety driven kind of OCD type thought that is not leading to any action. In contrast, it leads to avoidance behaviors, which is typical for OCD type, and rituals to counteract those thoughts. And so often what happens is that moms stop interacting with the baby or only interact with the baby when there are other people present. So that because they are worried to be alone with the baby. And in fact, moms never act on this. This is an, a, a condition that is e easily treatable with CBT and with some SSRIs. This has to be contrasted with a, a rarer condition that could be driving this and that's psychosis that I highlighted before, which is 
egocentric thoughts of harming the baby, but it's in the context of a delusional thought process and it makes sense to the mom. And she might have other symptoms that go along with psychosis as well. So this is the, the thought of the world is you know, bad, nihilistic delusions, everything is coming to an end. And I hear a voice saying, you know, go and connect with, you know, you and your baby can be saved uh, and, you know, you go to heaven. And then the mom jumps off the balcony with the baby and, um, you know, into kind of a, 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 a savior delusional fantasy that she's going to be reunited with God. Had, had that. I'm not making this up. So these are delusional thoughts. You have to surface them. This I'm telling you because you need to surface this. Moms will not tell you. you. But you can normalize by saying, well, given that you are, you know, showing some anxiety and depression, you know, sometimes some moms who have that tell me that they have these really strange thoughts, such as, have you ever had that? You know, uh, and then mom feels relieved that she can disclose. And then, you know, you can lead her to treatment. Moms are worried to disclose because they feel like you're going to call CPS on them. And that's not necessary. You, that moms, if it's OCD, do not, con do not follow through with it. You normalize, you validate, and you start treatment. If she's psychotic, similarly, you, you normalize, you kind of say, wow, I hear you. However, it sounds like that really right now you are struggling and it's, I'm concerned about your safety right away. Let's go together to the psych ER or let me call and you, we need family members here and then we get you to the inpatient unit. So don't leave mom alone. Okay. I told you that without appropriate psychiatric uh, Ill, uh, attention, bipolar illness or depression, severe depression with, with, with and without psychosis has a high relapse rate in pregnancy and postpartum. And that's very important. I want to highlight that because if you have someone who is well stabilized, treated on meds or without, and they go into pregnancy, you know, the relapse risk is there. And particularly if they were taking off medicines and it was quickly withdrawn, it could be that they relapse at you know, the usually at end of pregnancy or definitely in the first month postpartum. In fact, we know that the highest rate for women to be admitted to an inpatient psychiatric unit is in the first four weeks after they give birth. Uh, studies over studies. So let's go to trauma, a topic dear to my heart. This is also where my research lies. Well, trauma is common in a woman's life, particularly interpersonal violence. One out of every four girls have been sexually abused in this country. 20% of women have IPV, adult interpersonal violence in their relationships. IPV is not uncommon in pregnancy. In fact, um, just recently a paper that actually, you know, the, the, it's increasing and particularly during COVID again, IPV rates increased and um, women might, you know, more and more women lose their life in the in pregnancy in the first year postpartum due to homicide. Um, and then there's, there's trauma of birthing. So 30% of women experience the birth as traumatic. Obese often don't even know that that it's such a high number. Not everybody develops PTSD, obviously, but, um, but a, a new onset PTSD after a traumatic childbirth is around 3%. In general, women have a lifetime prevalence, which means your chance as a woman to have PTSD at, at some point across your life to be diagnosed is 12%. It's twice as much as men. Why is that? Because while in men, the number one reason for PTSD is combat-related PTSD, women are less likely, also likely, but less likely to be in combat and to have uh, PTSD from this. But women are likely to be sexually molested. And sexual abuse in childhood is one of the biggest predictors for PTSD in adult women's life. Um, as you can see here, the, it's the single strongest predictor. PTSD is a waxing and waning illness. And so it gets better, it gets worse, and you know there's re-traumatization uh, through triggers. And OB care, the exams, 
the birth, the loss of control, all of these are potential triggers for re-exacerbation of PTSD symptoms. So that's very important to be aware of. And one of the things that I want to highlight about PTSD uh, trauma is um, from a psychological perspective, the trauma is really a, a, a violation of our baseline assumptions that we are basically have innate as children growing up and going forward in life is it's the assumption that the world is a safe place and that there are relationships that are safe and healing. So that's relational trust. We have that if you remember Ericksonian stages in, in the first year or two of life, this is where relational trust, trust versus mistrust gets established. Well, trauma shatters that often because trauma is also per per perpetrated by trusting people. Um, and the second is the trust in your own self-efficacy, that you are valuable, worthy, lovable, and uh, competent. And so with that, both of these are shattered by trauma. Of course, the younger you are in life, the more it's a, a developmental unfolding of that deficit. And it leads to emotional dysregulation, which we then we have many names for that in psychiatry, right? Borderline personality features, complex PTSD, bipolarity, mood swings, all of that, what, what youngsters, teenagers, and then persons show this mood dis instability and, and, and identity instability and, and uh, instable, volatile relationships and a lot of somatic symptoms and dissociating and all of this is kind of in that category of emotion dysregulation. And it leads to isolation because you don't want to be around other people and nobody wants to be around you. So at the end of the day, it leads to lower help-seeking behavior. And that's, that's on us then as providers. These patients are not easy patients, right? Because they are pushing us away. We are trying to reach out to them within our systems and the confines of our framework, you know, busy clinic. I have an opening and the woman comes late and then she's difficult and I want to move it along. And, and he, she, he or she, she has all these demands or, or worries. And so often providers get quite irritated, right? With, 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 because it's, it's, it's pushing against our own limits. And so often there are the no shows and such. And so this, we have to be aware that help seeking is really diminished in particularly those who are traumatized and need it the most. And then the mental health problems and then kind of intergenerational transmission of the risk. So now if I'm overwhelmed, dysregulated, and I have no access to care and help, well, the likelihood that I'm going to then lash out or, or pass it on and be irritated and less and maybe more harsh in my parenting and maybe more likely to be uh, neglectful or abusive is higher. And so we know from research that that's basically one of the pathways. Um, and I, uh, in my caseload, I see women who have all these issues that then leads to depression, trauma, anxiety, PTSD, substance use, and it's a vicious cycle. And we know from all the data that there is a high comorbidity. Basically, I think there is no such thing as postpartum depression alone. Often it's beyond depression. It's a comorbid picture of a lot of mood issues from mood instability, dysregulation to depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance. Um, well, this is an older slide, but actually it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, um, just highlighting, uh, you know, that substance use is, is common. The, these real, the, the proportions didn't change, even if the, the numbers are maybe, you know, a little bit upwards now, particularly with marijuana. I mean, now a lot more, I mean, I think I think 10% of women or more are using, um, but still tobacco and alcohol are actually the number one substances used in pregnancy. And as you know, alcohol is particularly dangerous for the congenital malformations, fetal alcohol syndrome. But then we have other substances, you know, now with marijuana being widely used. And then 
the painkiller, Oxycontin and such, and, and, you know, the other opioids. And then we have cocaine and methamphetamines and, and, and such. So that, that is your, that is your kind of arena. And, and that's the support from the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is, is really in order to tackle some of that, you know, then this added problem of, of addiction, we really need in pregnancy, uh, medication assisted treatments to counteract um, some of the uh, tolerance and dependency uh, symptoms. Um, what's the impact of untreated illness? What are this now? And, and now again, going back to depression, anxiety, um, as well as, of course, then substance use, PTSD. If you don't treat, if we don't reach these women, uh, it has an impact on their pregnancy. I mean, there's a no brainer. And uh, in terms of, you know, lifestyle that then impacts nutrition and weight gain that is adequate to prenatal care, you know, follow through to medical comorbidity. We know that the likelihood for gestational diabetes, preeclampsia infections are like by three, a factor three to five increased when you have untreated mood disorder. Of course, unhealthy coping skills, which then goes along with also substance use and then the risk for suicide and overdose. Um, it has an impact on the neonate or the fetus and the neonate, of course, because now the, in, the, the, the fetal development is impinged upon by um, the substance, by the illness. We even know that depression, untreated depression, most likely through a mechanism of elevated cortisol levels that are floating in the mom's circulation, but also through some inflammatory markers, m impacts now preterm birth rate, spontaneous abortions, intrauterine growth, retardation, low birth weight of, of the term baby, neonatal aspects, like the babies are born to mothers with depression more temperamentally fussy and that's not because they are exposed to any medicine or maybe the SSRI or, or or any other illicit substances it's untreated illness alone and again we think it's through inflammation it's through cortisol that uh, might be passed on um, and then also postpartum impact on parenting bonding breastfeeding follow through with well baby visits well let's go to detection so I'm from data and my own experience doing this now 20 some years. If we don't use standardized screening tools, often providers forget or don't ask about mood symptoms and in some way collude with the patient not wanting to talk about this. So I really propose to you, please use standardized uh, screening tools. It should be universal screening with anxiety, depression. We have this EPDS that's commonly used or the PHQ-9 or two. We have PTSD screeners, trauma screeners. You can screen for childhood as well as for IPV. And then of course for substance, substance the five Ps or, or any other substance use screener. Access to treatment. Well, treatments we have good treatments for these conditions in pregnancy and postpartum. From psychoed to psychotherapy as the first line, we should do that as a first line and we have really evidence-based treatments from CBT, IPT to DBT uh, for individual or group. We, we at the University of Michigan just developed a perinatal DBT group. Um, but we also have in Michigan good access to home visiting programs for Medicaid eligible moms, like maternal infant health programs through the Department of Health, as well as infant mental health through community mental health. Free of charge, home-based treatments for high risk moms, that's the way to go. Then very important, all these complementary approaches. I told you, often I referenced now that inflammation is one of the mediators for bad outcomes. So inflammation, we now know that, you know, omega-3 fatty acids reduce inflammation, vitamin D, light therapy, exercise, mind, body, yoga, all of these things are reducing inflammation. So if there is, um, if there is access that you have and, um, I will then reference a resource for you where you can find access to these resources if you don't know it yourself. Um, 
you should be offering those. Everybody likes something different. So not, so not everybody's into yoga, something that's totally stupid. Yeah, okay, then don't do yoga, do something else. Um, but having kind of that complementary alternative approach as a, as a, in your toolkit. And then for many moms, breastfeeding is, is a protector for their mood. That, that is, I'm not saying that breastfeeding per se is an antidepressant, but it will help mom with the good support and if it's then working for her it is actually through the oxytocin mechanism reducing depression and anxiety so that's also important to know well and then we have medicines and we know that 13 percent of women take psychotropic medicines in pregnancy or or then postpartum and it's really it's the ob it's the primary care physician it's the nurse midwife, it's the, um, it's the nurse practitioner who are the frontliners. 60, 70% of all prescription in pregnancy postpartum is happening by the primary care provider. So they need to be aware and they need to know how to prescribe safely. Well, and that's a big issue is like, well, what is safe? And uh, of course, ideally, you have no illness, no need for medicine. But if you have illness, there's a risk to untreated illness, as I said. And you have to counteract that and balance that with the risk for treatment. And the bottom line is there is no risk-free zone. And we have good psychotropic meds that are safe. And given that uh, you are the prescribers or OB PCPs are the prescribers, they need to know about safety profiles. And with that, I want to highlight a program that I'm running. This is this MC3 perinatal that, that was named in the beginning. It's, a, it's basically a psychiatry, a perinatal psychiatry access program for the frontliners. This is actually the QR code, how to sign up free of charge right away. You can do this while I'm telling you the rest of this slide. It takes 10 seconds to sign up. So please all do so. Take out your smartphones and just hold the QR code to your, to your, to your lens and, and sign up. It gives you free of charge across Michigan, same day phone consult to ask any question about perinatal psychiatry issues. Um, we have the same issue program for child psychiatry. So you can ask about that as well. It gets then directed either to the perinatal psychiatrist or the child psychiatrist. But bottom line is questions that are asked is like diagnostically, I, I don't know my way around, or I don't know what is safe. What should I start treatment with? What kind, what kind of resources are in my area in terms of psychotherapy or, or um, what, what should I be thinking about? What should I be assessing? We are providing all of that. We are giving you the resources in the, in the vicinity. We're giving you access to the apps or to the self-care toolkits that we developed or that are out there that you can pass on to your patients. And we are walking you through basically and holding your hand how to prescribe. The reason why we are not taking over your patients is because there are not enough of us. You are the ones who are basically doing the, the bulk of the work and you have to continue doing that. And then in... Um, uh, we also do these webinars and downloadable tool, tools like psychopharm cards that we are sending out to, to provide us. And then in select counties, we even have remote behavioral health uh, consultation that where we basically give free psychotherapy for the women uh, through remote channels. And telepsychiatry is is that we would see the patient for a one-time consultation if it's really, um, 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 you know, tricky diagnostically. So this is, this is how the psychopharm cards look like. And again, if you look it up here, you can download it as a PDF. Um, uh, here is the, the, you know, the, the web page with all the information on MC3, and this is our webpage of Zero to Thrive, which I'm the director. A lot of tools downloadable from there as well. So, as I said, the challenge, the solution, detection, awareness, and then uh, access. I want to highlight one more thing for in terms of access. Right now, I told you about the solution that we want to give providers the know-how 
the consultation and the training so that they know what to do. But right now we are piloting this program where we also want to give the moms you know, uh, empowerment and put them in the driver's seat uh, where we encourage them to self-screen through an app and then have this remote access to therapy. And this is how um, um, in select uh, counties, this is available. Uh, and so I, if you email me, if you are in Wayne, Macomb, or Oakland County, and you are interested in learning more about that, just email me. Maybe your clinic would like to sign up for that self, um, self-care or kind of self, self-screening app. We can install it. We can give you the iPads with the screen on, and then they can access our uh, therapists for free. So with that, I'm right now in kind of, I have a couple of cases that we could talk about, but maybe I stop here for a sec and just see if there are questions that I can answer. And maybe you have some cases that you would like to talk about. Mm. So I, I, any um, wonder how, Tim, how should I go about this? Are there questions from the audience? Or is there a case that somebody wants to bring up? Um, is there that they want to talk about a case that they had? Or shall I just go into my own cases? I don't see any questions posted in the chat. Uh, if somebody feels more comfortable uh, unmuting and presenting, if they have any questions, by all means do so. Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to uh, the, the cases that we have in the presentation. OK. Give it a second. Okay, so let me let me just kind of um, you know walk through this. I mean, I, I have a couple of like cases that are like the the typical cases that I would kind of see, right? So this is a twenty five year old mom woman who presents eighteen weeks gestation. So she's just in the beginning of the second trimester, um, and. And she says, gosh, you know, I have this, a lot of people say, I, I was diagnosed as bipolar when I was younger. Um, and this one said, oh, when I was 19 and 22, I was, uh, I was suicidal. And then I took some mood stabilizer. Nobody ever can remember what they took. But, you know, she says, I got better. So, um, and often, my, sometimes you might hear that they say, oh, I, I was put on different medicine, nothing worked. Um, and the most important is that this mom says, okay, so I had something, I was um, uh, hospitalized, so that's already a warning sign, because in, in this country, you don't get hospitalized that easy, right? You have to be pretty sick to get into the hospital. She was twice hospitalized, was on some medicine that improved the symptoms and got better, and, and now she is early pregnancy and was taken off of her medicine by her psychiatrist. Um, already two years ago, because she was doing better, um, um, I, 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 number one, and be, uh, she was she she had a previous pregnancy and then miscarried and then never restarted. Um, and since then, she had like these brief episodes of more energy and irritability, which again might be kind of for you that you think, hmm, is this kind of a resurgence of some mood instability, like hypomania that could look like that. So with that, and the field survey of the baby looks good at this point. So with that, you might kind of ask yourself, so what else would I want to know um, in order to make a determination, what am I going to do next? What is my next, um, you know, she's now saying, I am starting to feeling low and moody. So something is kind of emerging, right? So what am I, what else do I need to know to know? Am I believing that this is a bipolarity? Am I wanting to get old case records? Do I want to know what medicines? What else should I be starting? Do I start having a discussion about medicines? Should I start about psychotherapy? Um, any, any strategies? Um, and if somebody wants to speak up, speak up. If, you, if this case kind of looks familiar to you or you have been in this, um, or if you would want 
um, what your next move would be. And what is your differential, right? Because the differential could be very broad, right? It could be that maybe this was all always a depressive disorder, a major depressive disorder with suicidality and maybe with some, you know, um, mood instability, but which was because irritability, as you know, in young people, depression looks like irritability. So it's less the depressed mood and being sad, it's more being irritable. So it could be MDD recurrent. It could be a bipolar illness and actually that irritability now and the low mood and in the past that she all along had more a depressive bipolar or a mixed bipolar. We call it mixed when you have signs of so hypomania, like agitation, dysphoria, but at the same time with negative, you're not elated, you're not happy, but you are more kind of, you know, dark and, and, and sad and suicidal. So if you have both the signs of ma hypomania, mania and, and depression. Of course, there could be anxiety. Of course, there could be some grief actually going on, right? You know, that right now she's 18 weeks gestation. She's worried. Am I going to miscarry again? Actually, this is all grief, unprocessed previous miscarriage. And now it's coming back. We see this again and again. Women get pregnant again and haven't, uh, haven't had bereaved the previous pregnancy. There could be substance use going on that she never disclosed. There could be trauma that we don't know, there could be something going on in the here and now, there could be something in the childhood and all of this, it could be all of the above. The most important is you need time, you need to assess, you need more information before you jump to any of it or disregard it. And then this is what I was talking about before, that there's good data to show that women who are have bipolar illness. If this is in true a bipolar illness, and she was, she's off medicine, and it's whether she was never treated. I mean, let's assume. So at the beginning of pregnancy, all women, let's say, they are, uh, women are in good, they're mood wise, fine. So they're stable. So proportion of relapse, not relapsed is 100%. Everybody's healthy. You can see that across pregnancy of women who have been discontinued in the year before pregnancy in this study, that by the end of the pregnancy, basically all relapsed except 20% only 20% are left to be stable. And that's what I was talking about. Never stop a woman who has bona fide bipolar illness in pregnancy with their meds without monitoring them really weekly. <laughs> and particularly within three months because that's where they relapse. And even women who they didn't know that they have bipolar, they relapse. And then women who uh, were never treated uh, you know, might, might relapse. So where it's new onset. Um, the same is true for depression. If a woman has a bona fide MDD recurrent and she's healthy and not relapse at the beginning of pregnancy um, and you stop the medicine, the SSRIs or whatever antidepressant she is, she's going to relapse. And the women who relapse, either they stay off the medicine or you try to play catch up later on and restart medicine, at the end, only, you know, 30% are still well. So really, this is a, this is an important time. So for this woman, I mean, summarizing what I just said for this woman, you want to get the diagnosis straight. You want, if she's bipolar, do not discuss with her maybe to restart medicine and monitor that. Um, definitely do more frequent check-ins. Um, if you as an OB or PCP don't have time, refer her to a therapy um, or support group so that somebody else can um, have an eye on her and her moods um, and teach her 
early red flag warning symptoms. So I discussed with my moms, you know, it, it might be that she lives in a rural area. There is no access to therapy. There is no access to X, Y, and Z. And she doesn't want medicine and she is not into apps and she's not into yoga and exercise and all of that. Well, maybe there's a church group, maybe there's a support group that she wants to work or at least teach her the symptoms. Say, look, what was last time your, re your symptom when you really started to fall apart? Oh, you didn't sleep. Oh, you didn't eat. Oh, you get, got these weird thoughts. These are the three key symptoms that you are watching out for. If you notice them, that's where you call me. Or, and then include the family. Is it okay that we share with your partner these three symptoms? If he or another family member notices these symptoms, is it okay that they call? I almost make a written contract in order to um, have, somebody has an eye on this mom. Okay, let's do another one. 32-year-old um, second-time mom presents to PCP with husband six weeks postpartum for concerns. She's anxious, edgy, cannot relax, has poor sleep, racing thoughts, something bad will be happening to the baby, cannot stop these thoughts, ruminates struggles with since childhood with anxiety never as bad as this you will hear this again and again oh i always had anxiety but this is different this is weird this is awful i'm i'm i can't relax i'm always worried and she gets very tearful and then she says the past two weeks she had these hot images this flashes in her mind of stabbing the baby with a knife she knows she doesn't want to do it she doesn't want to hurt the baby she's terrified it, am I going crazy? Am I going to do it? So, and she has locked all the knives in the house and tries to avoid the baby. That's exactly what I was telling you before. Happens all the time. You surface that. You need to get to this disclosure. And now you can say, well, let me assess. Is this psychosis? Is she clear in her mind? Otherwise, does she have delusions, hallucinations? You just say, you know, I have a couple of routine questions. You know, is your mind playing tricks on you? Or, you know, have you ever had that, you know, hear voices, nobody's in the room? Have you ever seen things that nobody else sees? Are you having some bizarre thoughts that you are, you know, harassed or somebody's out there to hurt you? Do you, do you hear the, you know, voices telling you to do stuff? All of that is no and it's just anxiety, you start, um, you start uh, therapy. The best is to, um, so we already discussed differential, you start therapy. I tell you CBT, six session, eight session, and then number two, some self-care, relaxation, just validating, just saying, you know what, you are not crazy. This is going to go away. This is an anxiety disorder. We have medicines for that and we have therapy for that. Removes 40% of the worry for this woman and she gets better. Usually they get better within three, four weeks and it's gone. Um, so we already, you saw that we, we had that slide. I'm, I'm highlighting this because this is so common and it's such a shameful area and women don't want to talk about it. Well, I have nine more minutes. Can I go with one, another one? Um, okay, this is a 27 year old mom, 35 weeks gestation. So she's almost to give birth. And previously she had an MDD episode following the birth of her first child. Now she's symptom free, taking no medicine and says, I'm fine. Again, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking? And now you should be already rolling off these answers. Wish somebody would unmute and say, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. I just told you she had previous major depressive episode with the first kid. First of all, depression is a recurrent illness. If you had a previous episode, your likelihood to have a, another episode in general across your lifetime is 30 to 50%. Specifically for postpartum, if you had a previous postpartum episode, your chances are 50-50. With each pregnancy, it actually increases. So if moms, I have sometimes moms say, you know what? With the first child, I had nothing. My second child, I had postpartum anxiety. With my third child, I already had anxiety in pregnancy 
and some depression and postpartum. And now I have my fourth child. I can tell you that it gets basically worse and worse and worse and more every time. The good news is that you already should know, so you could already treat ahead and basically diminish the impact of the illness by, by offering treatment. But this woman has the pretty good chance that now postpartum with the hormonal changes, with the lack of sleep because she's feeding the neonate, Sleep, sleep deprivation is one of the biggest trigger for depression. Um, that she is going to relapse is really 50 plus percent. So what would I discuss with this mom? I would just lay it out with her and ideally the whole family and say, well, this is what the scenario is. You're, you have a chance that you're going to relapse with your depression. Tell me how it looked like last time. What are your signs? What is your specific form of depression how does it look for you and how can we a identify the red flags ahead what can you already do in terms of psychotherapy or complementary medicine um, or maybe self-care to prevent it and what was the severity of your depression last time if a mom says you know when i get depressed i'm really sick I don't even want to risk it that she gets depressed again. I'm going to ask her, do you want to already start now an antidepressant? So knowing that it takes us six to eight weeks till the medicine kicks in, really. Should we already get started now so we have coverage postpartum? If she says, no, my, my depression is not was not that bad and I really don't want any medicine now at the end of pregnancy because I don't want my baby to have neonatal withdrawal from that medicine, which is really not a big issue, uh, very rare actually with antidepressants. But if she says, I, I don't want that, I'm going to just say, let us monitor. Please touch base with me. So this is this is kind of the being really on top of it that's the issue to be so and then what kind of medicines should you start i mean this is like the options um all of this you could do you could start a medicine now you could start immediately after the delivery you could start you could watch and wait but monitor and start afterwards you could start definitely i would say refer to psychotherapy um you know, immediately, definitely. Um, in terms of what medicines, well, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, citalopram, which is Celexa, the new cousin is escitalopram, is Lexapro, or sertralin, which is Zoloft, all of them are good. It doesn't actually matter which one. All of them are compatible with pregnancy. All of them are compatible with breastfeeding. Um, so uh, there's really no, it doesn't matter which one um, you would date. But if you have questions, call MC3 Perinatal and they will talk you through. So I will not, um, um, I mean, although this might be a, a, a important case for you because this is what you also might see, a mom who is, you know, young, pregnant, is using some substances in, um, in pregnancy, um, but says, yeah, I, I quit the drinking, but I'm still smoking marijuana, um, and I have some uh, abuse history. Uh, often there is a history that is lifelong from childhood on to the here and now. And it's chaotic. And in my family, there was bipolar illness. So you think like, oh, you, do I have to monitor as well? And now I have, I'm freaking out. I, I can't sleep. I'm anxious. I'm on the edge. I'm, I, I'm, help me. Well, that's the complexity. You, are, you have to think about all of this. Is there complex PTSD? trauma have you know is there is there some bipolarity um so how would i assess i need to take time and get a little bit better history tell me all about you know your trauma if i don't have time for all of that as a provider please loop in warm handoff bring the social worker into the room introduce the social worker and send her you know here, here's someone who's going to help you, or you need someone to kind of help you and nurture you. You had so much going on. There's a, there's abuse happening. You know, you need, you need your, your village. 
let's loop in infant mental health from CMH or therapy. Um, let's get a better history on the substance use. Um, con kudos that you stop drinking. You know you want to do well to, for your baby. You know that that's harmful. Let's talk about how much weed you are smoking because we know chronic high dose of weed use, like marijuana use, actually impacts infant prefrontal cortex development and these kids down the road, not at birth, not in infancy, but at age three, four and up have more executive function problems with heavy um, MJ use. So we want to engage her into this discussion and remember that help seeking, pushing away, women with trauma push away. So you have to invest time. If you don't have time, bring people on board to, who have time and who can guide her and then you know, send her whatever supports she might need. But these are complex cases. Don't just start and think, oh, Zoloft is the, you know, the search running is going to be the, usually medicine alone is not the solution. Um, but this mom, eventually, if you think bipolarity and you do, we, there are good screening instruments like the mood disorders questionnaire. It's like a bipolarity question, like screener. If you have a screen, if, if you think that she and she can't sleep, one of the medicines that is really well tolerated, helps with sleep and for mood for bipolar depression is quetiapine or Seroquel. Safe in pregnancy, that could be your friend. Another one that takes long time, however, to get to a therapeutic dose and you might have to, don't start it when she's already freaking out. Start it earlier in the game, it's Lamotrigine good for bipolar depression, but it takes weeks till you are at the target dose of 200. You have to start at 25 milligrams and you in advance by 25 milligrams every two weeks. And so that takes several weeks till you are in the target dose. If you don't do that, you might cause the Steven Johnson allergic reaction, which could be lethal. So with that, I'm gonna stop here. And I hope that this was helpful and useful and practical. We do have a question in the chat. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you define heavy marijuana use? Do you mean several times a day? Yes, or? several times a day. And I'm happy to send you the slide. There are three longitudinal studies um, done in the 70s in uh, rural um, Ohio, one in the 80s in urban Philadelphia, mostly with BIPOC women, and then a third in the Netherlands, the Generation R study in the 2000s. All three converge that heavy daily, so daily use, you know, four or five joints um, um, uh, in uh, half, um, have impact on the child's executive functioning by age three, when they start going into preschool, right? When they need these higher order, you know, uh, functions of negotiating um, and, uh, you know, kind of inhibition of impulses, that's where the prefrontal cortex kicks in, right? And it goes, they did the studies, these are longitudinal studies. They then follow those kids up to age 21, the, the 1970 study, the kids are now 21 and older. They have imaging data where they show again and again, these, these, these brain areas, they're just having to work hard. And so no wonder that these kids then themselves are now struggling with, you know, behavioral inhibition, impulse control, executive functioning, attention, ADD, ADHD, all of this. So, okay. I hope, again, this was useful and you can take, take it from here and kind of use that material and, and. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was very informative. You're uh, most welcome. Does anybody have any other questions? I know Jennifer posted that she would love to see those studies. I yeah, I'll send you the slide with the references. All right, well, thank you all for attending and this recording will be posted to our website in the coming weeks. Uh, again, our website is michiganopioidcollaborative.org. And I thank you all for attending. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And please call MC3 Perinatal for any questions. And 
that uh, substance use that are the marijuana in pregnancy and the impact on the child is also on our webpage, the whole talk. So please use that, the resource. Sign up for MC3 Perinatal. Okay, bye everyone, happy weekend. Bye everybody.